Hey, hey, all right, now we have a new class for everybody. This is Photoshop for Artists. And the reason I'm doing this class is because, well, Photoshop's been out for a long time as an app. It's been here for 30 years. And the thing about it is that Photoshop has grown into this enormous powerhouse of an app that can do so many amazing things. And what I um, think is great about that is if you're a designer, if you're a photographer, if you're someone who does compositing, if you're even an animator, somebody who does 3D, you can come into Photoshop and you can get things done. But if you're an artist, if you're an illustrator who likes to draw and paint, you can open up the app and you can feel like this is really overwhelming. There's so much to do. Where do I begin? And this course, uh, this class, this master class of sorts uh, spread out over a few episodes is going to be aimed at those people who want to draw and paint and don't want to do anything else, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to narrow in on the tools that you need to know how to learn. And we're going to look at some features of Photoshop and some superpowers that you can take advantage of, but we're going to leave a lot of the other stuff out of it. So this is not like a Photoshop overview, if you will. This is a Photoshop overview specifically for people who like to draw, all right? And that's what we're going to do. All right, so uh, let's just jump right into it. And um, we're going to start here by looking at the welcome screen for Photoshop when you first launch it. And uh, what you're going to see, and we're going to walk through this uh, slowly here, is um, the files that you would have most recently worked on from Creative Cloud that are compatible with Photoshop. And that's what you're seeing right here, okay, where my cursor is. So this is going to be sort of your landing page where you can access recently used files as well as all of the files that you created dating all the way back uh, to when Creative Cloud began. So many years here worth of material. Now, if I were to just scroll through here, this is gonna just take me all the way back to about 2015 or 16, uh, there are thereabouts from when I started using Creative Cloud. But here on my home screen, what I'm gonna have are the most recently used uh, documents right here. So if maybe there was something you were drawing in Fresco and you wanna open it up in Photoshop, you simply open Photoshop and it should show up right here in this recent uh, category here. And uh, the same goes for anything else that would be a compatible file that Photoshop can handle, okay? Now, um, first things first, I really want to point this out because it's one of the things that people miss a lot with Adobe apps in general, not just Photoshop, but Illustrator and Fresco and InDesign and so on. Um, we have tutorials right here on the landing page. And if you browse those tutorials, you're going to be able to go by category and sort through all kinds of amazing things you can learn how to do right here within the own within uh, our own environment. These are things that our studio has produced. These are things we've produced with the help of other people. But these are really good tutorials and um, they're easy to follow. And uh, they're right there. If you look to the right, what we also have are in-app tutorials. So when you're in Photoshop, you can actually be learning while you're using the app directly in the app with those tutorials as well and you can learn more about that right here. Or you can tap on the Learn tab over here on the left, and look at this. You've got all kinds of wonderful things with a sort of an overview, get to know layers, selections, how to add an image, etc. There's going to be a whole bunch of those, and if you go to View All, you can see everything else that's available there. So you are not limited to watching courses, you know, with people like myself on YouTube, etc. Um, you can actually learn right here in the app and um, use our Adobe Learn content as well. So I wanna make sure that people know about that. So back to our home screen here. Um, if I wanted to open a recent file, I would simply double click on that and I'd be off to the races. What we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new document. Okay, that's what we wanna do right now um, because uh, that's something that people often have to do is start from scratch. So here you see new file. And what I'm gonna do throughout this class with everybody is I'm going to teach you keyboard shortcuts. I'm a huge proponent of uh, keyboard shortcuts, big fan. I use them to work efficiently, to work fast, and it makes everything a lot easier. Now, if you're not familiar with the keyboard shortcuts, of course, there's a learning curve. It'll take some time for your fingers to just sort of naturally do what they need to do. But it's important to learn these because they will really improve the experience that you have with the app uh, drawing. And especially when you've got that brush in your hand, and you're actively drawing or painting, having your free hand available on the keyboard to switch tools, to make your brush bigger or smaller, call up your eyedropper tool and all kinds of other things, this is really gonna speed up the workflow. Now the alternative to that is if you have a, a drawing tablet that gives you hotkeys or 
shortcut keys on the actual drawing tablet, you can program those to do a lot of commonly uh, used um, actions, and that can be great as well. But even then, I would say it's extremely beneficial to know what the keyboard shortcuts are because there may come a time when you have to work on somebody else's machine and with a different drawing tablet that may not have those hotkeys and they're not readily available. So it's always good to learn them. So we're going to start with a new file and that would be on a Mac Command N or on a PC Control N. Throughout these courses, I'm going to probably say Command more than anything else. Just remember that if you're on a PC, when I say command, you think control. When I say option, you think alt. Okay, command, control, option, alt. All right, I'm working on a Mac, so it's easier for me to say command, but these keyboard shortcuts work for everybody, okay? All right, so if I were to hit command N, it's going to call up a new document, um, uh, a new document uh, set of options for me so that I can be working right here. And I can choose some presets from recent documents that I've created. And you'll notice that Photoshop saves about 20 of those for me right here, okay? These are commonly used sizes. Um, and I can also start from scratch right here and I can set up a document. And one of the things that people moving from traditional media to digital media have trouble understanding is what the size really means when you're looking at these options for pixel dimensions and resolution. I want to keep this very, very simple. We're not going to get into all the nitty gritty. Like I said, this course is just to give you what you need to know for drawing and painting. I could spend an entire hour just talking about setting up a document, but we don't want to do that. So here's what I'll tell you. If you are creating something for print, okay, just make sure that the resolution you use is a minimum of 300 pixels per inch. 300 pixels per inch. That's gonna be the first thing you wanna do. So currently I have it set to 72. Now, the reason for that is that is a screen resolution, okay? But I'm gonna change that to 300. All right, now once I've done that, I can now change the actual physical size of the document in terms of its pixels, or if I use this drop down menu, I can look at inches, centimeters, millimeters, points, and picas. The number of people using points and picas is probably be, uh, was probably um, shrunk to about 0.01% of the people using Photoshop, so we don't need to cover that. Um, those of you who are going to be making illustrations for any purpose, whether it's for magazines and books, um, if it's going to be online, we'll think about pixels, but if it's going to be for printed format, magazines, books, advertisements, whatever it happens to be, uh, you're going to be wanting to think in, in inches, centimeters, and millimeters. All right, so just for uh, keeping things simple, I'm going to go for inches and I'm going to say that I want to set up a document at exactly eight inches across, that's our width, okay, by six inches in height. Now, when I've set up the physical size, remember the most important thing about this is that this resolution be a minimum of 300. And the reason for that is by setting that resolution at 300, if I were to print this piece that I work on in Photoshop, I'm going to get 300 pixels of data, of information, okay, for every inch, which is enough for me to get a clean, clear picture printed. Anything less than this, you're going to start to experience what's called, what's called pixelation. And if you've ever looked at a, a JPEG or something online that you thought, oh, that's a cool picture, and then you go to print it, and it looks all fuzzy, okay? Or you print it and instead of it being the size you think it's gonna be, it winds up printing about the size of a, uh, a postage stamp. Well, the reason for that is because the resolution was low. So with a resolution at the minimum of 300 pixels per inch, I can be assured that whatever physical size my document is, eight by six, for example, okay? When I print it, it's going to look crisp, it's going to look clean, it's gonna look clear, and everything's going to be good. Now, some people like to work at higher resolutions than this. Uh, frequently, that'll be people who do comics work. They'll do 450 or 600 pixels per inch. Uh, but this is not totally necessary. I'm just mentioning it. Make sure it's a minimum of 300. 90% of what I do is 300 pixels per inch. Look at your color mode next right here. Um, RGB is the default. Okay, This is just the screen uh, colors, red, green, and blue. 
You can also set it up for CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black for four color printing. However, I'll say that um, while this used to be a, a sort of a, a, a expectation or a standard um, for people who are working digitally expecting things to go to print, it's no longer necessarily the case. Now that there are a lot of printers uh, with you know multiple inkwells, different colors, 13, 16, 17, 18, 19 colors um, for inkjet printers, for example, they can really handle the RGB spectrum quite well. Um, in addition to that, there are also other kinds of printers now that if you have an RGB file, they can get pretty close to printing uh, what's there. Just remember that with printing, what you have is an additive process where you have a white piece of paper normally, and you're adding ink to it. So white is as bright as things are going to get, and everything else is going to be darker than that because you're adding ink to that uh, paper or to that surface. Uh, with a screen, it's really light in your face. Uh, so you have these red, green, and blue lights that are being projected into your eyeballs, and that's why you can make really, really bright and saturated colors that don't always print so well. But because of this class being something where I want to talk about drawing and painting, I'm going to show you a really, really useful trick for ensuring that whatever your colors are, they're always going to print pretty fine. All right, and I'll show you that when we get into our document. So I would say it's fine to set up an RGB color and just work in that color space, especially if you use the trick I'm going to show you here shortly when you're working. If you're really worried about it, you can work in CMYK color. If you do set up a document in CMYK, the colors that you select um, in your with your color gamut, uh, when you have your color wheel and you decide to choose different colors for the document, you're going to have a limited range of colors uh, because they're not going to be able to print um, as clearly, and so Photoshop is going to restrict that gamut for you. All right, we're going to stick with RGB color. And um, don't worry about the background contents. We're never going to use our background layer because we are going to be smart, and we're always going to create our own background layer, and you'll find out about why that's important in a moment. Uh, don't worry about your color profile right now, and don't worry about your pixel aspect ratio. Square pixels are just fine, OK? None of these things are going to be applicable in this class. We're just going to go through the basics of everything you need to know so you can be off to the races making your own art as soon as possible. Alrighty, so let's check in here and say hi to some folks. Thanks for joining us. What's up, Uma Korn? Um, 240 points per inch is minimum to be printable. Yes, that's true, but I say 300 to be safe. Absolutely. Um, what's up, RB, Kathleen, Daniel, and Gareth, and Sam, and Rob, all these fine folks. Hey, Steve. How are, how's everybody? Thanks for joining me. Gary, how you doing? Nice to see you all. Alrighty. Um, I recognize a lot of names in this chat. I think all these people probably already know this stuff. So this is just going to be sort of a refresher. Uh, don't want to bore you folks out there. But for those of you who are new to Photoshop and want to draw and paint, I hope this is going to be useful for you. In fact, I know it will be. All right, so we've got our document set up 8 by 6 inches and 300 pixels per inch. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm just going to hit Create and we're going to be ready to go. All right, first things first, when you have your document open, there are three viewing modes for Photoshop. Now, everybody's different, but I like to be able to view Photoshop as a full screen uh, experience. All right, I like to just be really focused on drawing. I like to make sure that I maximize my screen real estate. And the easiest thing you can do when you first open a document is toggle through those, and see what you like, and I do this with the F key. F is in Frank, okay, or Frankfurter. Hit F one time, and it's going to take you to this full screen mode where you have all of your menus on the left and the right. And this is what I like to do. I like to work in this mode. And one of the main reasons for this is it eliminates the scroll bars on the left and um, the, the, sorry, the right and the bottom, left or the bottom, whatever, wherever the scroll bars show up, it just eliminates those. And you may think that's a problem. You think, well, how do I get around my document? Well, if my document were zoomed in like this and I wanted to move from left to right, the second keyboard command I want to teach you right here off the bat when you're in Photoshop is holding down the space key. Now you notice when I hold it down, my cursor changes to a little hand. Now if, if I tap anywhere and move, okay, I'm able to move around my document by holding down that space key. Okay. And that means I can move it down here as well 
If I were in the viewing mode, we'll hit F once more, which takes us to full screen with no menus. And F once more returns us to that original view. You'll notice now that I have scroll bars, okay, that I can use to move around. To me, this is a waste of time to move to the scroll bars, move to the scroll bars and move things. The keyboard command, the space bar, is a much more practical way to do this by once again hitting F. So I'm in that viewing mode. I can do this. I can hold down the space bar and easily move around my document. The other great thing about this is by holding down the space bar, I'm already part of the way towards being able to zoom in and out. Now this is something you're going to very, very frequently do when you work digitally, whether in Photoshop or anywhere else. Zooming is part of um, the experience when you're working digitally. Being able to zoom out means that you can see your work from a distance and see if it looks good. Think of it like stepping away from your easel. And being able to zoom in means you can work on details without having trouble seeing them. Easy peasy. So how do you do it? Well, the space bar comes into play again here. If I hold down the space bar and I hold down the command key, okay, with another finger, you'll notice that my cursor changes to a little magnifying glass. All right, space bar, command key. There you go. So by holding these two down and then tapping, I can zoom in. Now, if I want to zoom out, I can hold down the space bar and hold down the option key. Remember when I say option, I'm talking about max. If you're on a PC, I mean the alt key. Now the fact that these three keys are right next to each other on the keyboard makes them really easy to use. It's very convenient and you can have your fingers positioned in such a way that you can constantly be ready to hold down the space bar to move hold down the space bar and the command key or control key to zoom in or zoom out. These are essential keyboard commands for working quickly in Photoshop. All right, so that's your first part of the lesson there is moving around your document, okay? So get used to this, moving things around by holding the space bar down zooming in, zooming out. And after a few times using Photoshop and having these keys right under your fingertips, you're going to start to do this. It'll be second nature and you'll get used to it and you'll love it. Okay. There are other keyboard commands you can also set up and use for some of these actions like zooming in, zooming out. Some people like to use the number keys for that. Um, but what I like to do is keep things as close as possible to the bottom keys of the keyboard, close to where the trackpad is and or the, the bottom of your laptop or, the, or just the bottom of your keyboard. I like to try and keep things pretty close so I'm not really stretching with my fingers too much to get to where I need to go. There are exceptions to this, okay? There are some things I need to stretch to, uh, but some of these really basic ones I like to keep all in the same zone, okay? So there you go. All right, so we're looking at our document and you remember a moment ago, I mentioned that we're gonna create our own background. Well, what I meant by that was this. Here you have a background layer. Everybody has a background layer when they first open Photoshop. And by the way, your menus might not look exactly like mine. Everything in Photoshop is customizable. And we're gonna talk about that in a separate class about customizing the layout, but for now, I know that when you open Photoshop, no matter what happens with your layout, you should see layers. Layers are not the kind of thing that would be hidden, okay? Here they are, layers. And the background layer is always the very first thing that shows up in your layer stack. That's what we call this area here, where you're gonna have multiple layers that are going to be stacked on top of one another. And what I like to do when I first start a document before anything else is come right down here where there's a little plus sign at the bottom of the layer stack. Okay, and I'll take this out here. For those of you who can't see it, right here is a little plus sign. And that's gonna tell me that I can add a new layer. So I'm gonna hit that once and make sure that I have added a new layer. And now I'm good to go. 
Once I've added a layer, I'll just slide this over here. Now I feel confident that whatever I do going forward, I'm not going to be drawing on the background layer. The reason this is important is because in Photoshop, you want everything to be editable for as long as possible throughout the course of your creating your artwork. That's one of the advantages of working digitally, of course, is that it's endlessly reversible and uh, endlessly flexible. These are some huge advantages. For example, let's say that I were to have a shape like this, okay? And maybe I wanted to erase part of that shape, okay? So I wanted to just cut that out right there. If I were working on the background layer and I did this, let's see what would happen. Okay, I can now take this and I can move it around to whatever I want. It's its own thing on its own layer, but hang on a second. Let's go to the background layer. Let's make that shape. And then let's cut out this area. Now when I go to cut it out, look what it does. It brings up a menu. It says, you want to fill this with color? No, I want to erase it. Well, here's the catch with the background layer. There's nothing to really erase because everything on that layer is 100% filled with data. Okay, this is your pixel data. And that background layer is not editable, okay, apart from adding pixel data to it. This is one of the, the unique um, features of the background layer. Uh, most people would see it as a disadvantage. <laughs> Uh, I do, which is why I don't use the background layer. I let it sit there and be the background, and I don't let it do anything else. But by creating on separate layers from the background, you have full control over whatever happens on those layers. You can move them around. You can make shapes uh, on top of those. Sorry. I didn't mean to do that there. Sorry, gang. You can grab sections of them and move them around here, like so, cut them up, do all kinds of cool things, okay? And the best thing about that is that you can then take some pieces of one layer, transfer them to another layer, change the colors of those pieces, etc., 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 duplicate them, transform them, all these marvelous things. But if you try and do that on the background layer, you're stuck question I always get is, well, how come when you open a document in Photoshop, they don't give you the background layer and then automatically have a layer ready to go for you to work on so that you don't wind up with these problems? And my answer to that is, I don't know. Great question. However, in Fresco, we have done that. If you open a document in Fresco, you will automatically have a fresh, empty layer to work on and the background layer will be sitting underneath it. Just a good thing to know. So here in Photoshop, we get around that by creating a layer right off the bat, okay? And again, that's a little plus sign at the bottom right here. And if you can't see that because of my menu, I'll just pull this up here so you can see it again. There's a little plus sign. The more I tap that, the more I make more layers. There are no layer limits in Photoshop. If you have, you know, 600 or 1,000 layers, you may eventually have it start to get sluggish on you, a little slow. That's all down to your computer and your processing power and your memory and so on. But Photoshop is not going to create layer limits for you. If there is a limit, it's probably so high that people have probably never reached it. I never say never with Photoshop because, you know, people have done some crazy things with massive files with thousands of layers and so on. But uh, the odds of a digital artist who's drawing and painting ever getting to some kind of a layer limit, not likely. All right, now I just made a bunch of layers and then I took those layers and I um, deleted them by undoing. If you've ever used a computer to do anything in your life, you know that you can undo with Command Z or Control Z. Same thing works in Photoshop. Redo, you can do Command Shift Z or Control Shift Z to go forwards and backwards in your timeline. All right. Now, we want to get to the good stuff as soon as we can, so we understand that we can create layers right here. If you want to create your own background layer, okay, there's already a background, but just, just to be safe, I like to have an extra layer, and I just fill it with white. I can come back to it later and do other things. 
But this gives me an opportunity here to teach you a really useful key command. So to fill the layer with white or with any color on a Mac again, I'm using the uh, option delete. Option delete. That's going to fill with your foreground color. If you look here, my foreground color is blue. And then command delete, if I hit hold on the com uh, command key and hit delete. And remember on a PC, when I say command, I mean control. I'm going to fill with the background color. So it might be weird at first to know uh, to ask about why is Photoshop having two colors, a foreground color and a background color. Lots of reasons for this that come into play later, especially with painting. You're going to find there's, there's some superpowers you can do with these two colors. But for now, just accept that there are two colors and one is called the foreground color, one is the background. The foreground color is overlapping the background color and it's the color that's always selected by default. You can always select the background color if you wish and use that. And one of the great things you can do is you can use the X key, X, to toggle the, the foreground and background colors. So if you look over here for a moment and watch me hit the X key, you're gonna see that the colors will switch places. There you go. The default in Photoshop is to have black be the foreground color and white be the background color. If you ever want to reset back to the defaults where you want to be sure that you have pure black and pure white as these two colors, there's a little black and white set of squares just above the foreground and background color that you can tap on. Tapping on that will reset it, okay? Alrighty, now let's get into our menu right here of tools. This is where a lot of the good stuff's gonna happen. This is where you're gonna be able to make some images. And today, what I want to show you are some basic selections and some color fills. And we're going to make some illustration just with those tools. And there are artists out there who only use selections and color fills to do all their work. And these are world-renowned illustrators such as Bob Stack, who has done New Yorker covers and dozens of picture books for kids. His whole workflow is basically a couple of layers using basic selection tools and filling them with color. Pretty amazing. All right, so let's take a look at those. Now, I've got my basic background layer here filled with white. I'm gonna have a layer created just above it, a new layer. If you wanna get in good habits, I recommend you name your layers. You can double tap on any layer's title right here and call it whatever you like, okay? I'll just call this shape. It doesn't matter. A lot of people, they'll have 100 layers and it'll just say layer 1, layer 20, layer 36, etc. Um, and that can be a little hard to navigate. So if you want to get in good habits, you start naming your layers. And that's how you do it. Okay. All right, so here we go. If you look over here, we're going to skip this first tool for a moment. All right, this move tool. And come down to this tool right here. This is the marquee tool. And I want you to think of it as a tool that can basically draw a rope around an area, a lasso around an area, and you can fill it with color, okay? And in this case, you're gonna constrain that lasso shape to rectangles, squares, ovals, and circles. So we'll start by simply tapping anywhere on the screen and then dragging. And while we're maintaining contact, you notice I can change the size and shape of this rectangle. Once I pick up my stylus, or if I were using my keypad, if I were going to um, hold down the button and then let go, you're going to have what's called an active selection. An active selection is going to have little dancing lines around it that look like this. And these are telling me that this selection right now is quote unquote live, okay? And I can do something with it. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the thing I want to do today with you all is make selections and fill them with color. And remember how we just filled a color with our background layer. We used Option Delete and Command Delete. Option Delete was for the foreground color and Command Delete was for the background color. Well, look and see what your foreground color is. Here it's black, okay? I'm just going to hit Option Delete and look at that. It fills that area in with color. Only the selection, only the area I've selected is going to get filled. Now, if I hit Command D, 
this will deselect. So now that selection is gone, it's no more, and I'm ready to move on, okay? Before I do anything else, you may think, well, I don't want to use black for a color, I want to use something else. Well, don't worry about that. If you tap on the foreground color, it's going to pick up the standard color picker here for Photoshop. And of course, you have millions and millions of colors to choose from right here. You may notice though that I have a color wheel over here to the right. So let me cancel here for a moment and just come over here for a second. This is something that I love for colors. I like the way the color wheel looks and I like to use it because it also includes a hue slider, a saturation slider, and a brightness slider right here. Now with those three sliders, I can get really, really fine tuny with my colors. And then here, I really like to be able to move around with my hue, my saturation from left to right. Okay, left is desaturated, right is very saturated. And my brightness by moving up and down. So as I move upwards, my brightness goes up. Okay, moving to the right, I'm dealing with my saturation. And here I've got my hue, okay? So I like this color wheel. How do you get the color wheel? Well, step one, look over here where it says window. These are all the many windows you could have open in Photoshop. And as I said up top, this is for people who draw and paint, so we're not gonna look at 3D, we're not gonna look at a lot of these things, okay? But one thing you can have open if you wish is color right here. You notice there's a little check mark there. So if you have your color window open, you can put it anywhere you like on the screen. I have mine docked over here to the right, okay? And then there's a tiny little menu right here in the top right corner. We call these hamburger menus. And if I tap on that, I have a bunch of options for how I want color to be displayed. The third option down is the color wheel. By default, you'll have the hue cube. The third option is the color wheel. If you don't like the color wheel, you can always have the hue cube. People are very familiar with this one. And this does the same thing as the color wheel with regards to how if you move from left to right, you're making your color more saturated. If you move down and up, you are making the color brighter or darker. And here is where you control the hue with this little slider right here. Okay. Now, when we are setting up the document, I mentioned something about printing and how you should be concerned if the colors are a little too crazy and too bright, maybe they won't print as well. And this brings me to that cool little trick I wanted to teach you about color in Photoshop. Anytime you choose a color in Photoshop, if you see a little triangle show up right here, Okay, this is warning me that the color that I've selected may look fine on screen, but when I go to print it, there's a chance it will look a little less saturated, a little less bright. It might not be exactly what I want. If that's a big deal for me and I'm worried about it, all I have to do is tap on the little square to the right of that warning. And Photoshop will magically select the color that is the closest in hue, saturation, and value to the color I originally picked, but this new color will be guaranteed to be print safe. So that is a very handy trick for you, okay? So there we go, I've got a color selected there. I know it's print safe, that's great. Let's come back to our document here, and remember what I said about undo, Command Z. I'm gonna undo a few times until I don't have an active selection anymore. And I'll make a new selection by just dragging one out. And again, I'm gonna hit Option Delete to fill with that foreground color. And now we're using this new color right here. Now, while I still have this area selected, I can hit Command Z to undo, and I can keep the active selection, okay? and I can then change my color. If I wanna change my mind, option delete, try a different color. There we go. And I can do this to my heart's content. Step one way back, 
go ahead and fill some color and then go on my way. And then Command D is going to deselect and now I've committed to making that shape right there on the layer. Although, as you know, with digital art, I'm not totally committed to anything because I can always Command Z, Command Z, Command Z, and go backwards in time. And I don't even need a DeLorean. All right. Get in the habit of naming your layers. <laughs> now and future you will thank you, says Sam. Yes, Sam, you're absolutely right. Many of us just don't do it. <laughs> um, myself included, I'm very lazy about it. I can't help myself. It's just how it goes. All right. Thanks for joining us, Sean. All right, here we go. So let's take a look at what else we can do with the selection tools. I'm going to make a selection, okay? And I'm then going to say, well, I kind of want to add to this selection. This is where things get interesting. You can start to actually draw, make shapes that are custom shapes. If I hold down the Shift key, you notice a little plus sign shows up next to my cursor. If I make another selection, look what happens. These two selections get joined together. Let's do it again. And again. There we go. And again. And again. Hmm. Now look, I can take my colors, I can move those around, and I can hit Option, Delete, just like that. All right, I made an interesting shape. Let's go ahead and hit Command D to deselect. Now, a lot of people okay would not show you what I'm about to show you next they would wait until future lessons and things not me for people who want to draw and paint I want you to know the cool stuff the good stuff as soon as possible so here we go pay attention right over here where I see this layer there is this little guy that says lock right here and the first option is transparency Okay, so we're going to lock our transparency by tapping on that option. And now let's see something cool. Ready? I'm going to change my color to black right here. And with our rectangular marquee tool, I'm going to come outside of this area here and I'm going to make a selection right here like this. Now you may think that if I were to hit option delete now, I'm going to add a big fat rectangle here, but I'm not. Watch what happens. Hmm. It only changed the color of the area that was selected for the pixels that already existed on the document. Let's try that over here. Same thing. And over here, same thing. And now we have a little dog. So we're already making a drawing, we're already making an illustration, and we were able to change the color of what was on the layer by locking the layer transparency and then making a little change. Maybe I want this dog to have a little spot right here. And I want it to be sort of a light yellow color. Again, I can do this. Draw outside of the boundary to make sure it's going to be covered. Hit Option Delete and just fill in that little spot right there. Okay. So this is called locking layer transparency. It's a very powerful thing and a good thing to be aware of. And I like people to know about it sooner rather than later. It allows you to go ahead and make modifications to the existing pixels on a layer. By making bigger selections, if I had a big brush, I could paint over a big area and only affect 
the pixels that were already on that layer with that big brush stroke. So there's a lot you can do with that. If you tap on the lock once more right here, you can unlock your layer transparency. And now you're back to making shapes. And so maybe I want to give this dog a little tail. I just do this, give him a little tail. All right. But even just with the square, we can start to make some shapes and we can start to draw some stuff. Okay. But let's take it a step further. Okay. I make a new layer. To hide and show layers, you just tap on the little eyeball that is right next to where that layer is. Okay. And now I'm making a new layer. And I want to show you some other things you can do here as we build our skills. Make a selection, hold the shift key down, and add to the selection. But now we'll hold the option key down. And I'll select this little area right here. And when I let go, aha, look at that. I've now erased part of the selection. This means you have additive and subtractive functions with the marquee tool, okay, where I can add to something by holding the shift key, like so. And I can subtract by holding the option key. <coughs> Excuse me. And there you go. So now I can make custom shapes that are both additive and subtractive using exactly the same tool and the option key and the shift key. This is why up front I said it's so important to get familiar with these keyboard shortcuts because they're going to allow you to move really fast through the process of creating your images. All right, we haven't even gotten to brushes and things like that, but to be able to make selections very, very quickly to edit those selections on the fly, etc., you're going to have to be able to do these things. So now I've got this shape. I'll hit Option Delete and fill it with color. I can hit Command D, which means I've deselected. And I can come over here and I can lock my layer transparency. And then I can go over here and select sort of a pinkish red color and add a little nose right there. and maybe some shapes inside the ears there. Use some white right here. And now I want to use black again for the eye, but I don't want to come over here and select the color from my color picker. No. What I want to do is I want to select color that's already on the canvas. Very easy to do. Hold down the I key, the letter I, and look what I have. This is a eyedropper tool. If I tap, I can select color from on the canvas. See this? And if I hold it down and move it around, I can select color as well. So I want black. When I let go of the letter I, I'm right back to the marquee tool here. Okay. So that's a nice quick thing to be able to do. Option delete. I've got a little eyeball. Okay. So again, holding down the I key means I temporarily call up the eyedropper tool and I can select colors. Just like that. I let go. And now I'm back to whatever tool I was using a moment ago. Now everything I've been doing here is using blocky shapes. Okay. I want to be able to use circles as well. That's really going to expand what's possible. So I'll hide this, make a new layer. And let's take a look at the elliptical marquee tool. Now with tools in Photoshop, if you tap on any tool, okay, nothing happens. But if you long tap on a tool, if it has a tiny little arrow next to it, this means it has subtools. So by tapping on the marquee tool and holding for a moment, you'll notice I now can access the elliptical 
marquee tool. So we'll go to that and I can start to draw ellipses. Same as I was doing with the square. And you saw what I just did there. I made a selection and I moved it. Make a selection, move it. Make a selection, move it. How do you do that? Well, if you make a selection and move inside of that selection, you can tap and drag, like so, okay? If I hold down the Shift key and draw another one, I'm starting to add to my selections, just like I was doing before. Now what if I want to toggle between my elliptical marquee and my rectangular marquee tools quickly? This brings up another good key command to learn right up at the top. And as I go through these, I recommend that you get a little notebook and keep it at your desk and just jot down all these key commands. Give yourself a little cheat sheet so you can remember them. Eventually they'll be second nature, but I do mention a lot of them. We've talked about already holding down the space bar to move the document holding down the spacebar with the command key to zoom, holding down the spacebar with the option key to zoom out, right? Being able to add to a selection using the shift key, make a selection, hold down the shift key, add to the selection, right? And then holding down the option key to cut out part of a selection. Shift additive, option or alt key on a PC, subtractive. Command D for deselecting, we talked about that. And um, we also, uh, let's see, what else did we cover? I'm trying to think here for a moment, let's see. Well, one that we didn't talk about, but that's really important is the key for the tool that you're using. So since this is the marquee tool, this is easy to remember, the letter M will call up the marquee tool. Now, I said a second ago, I'd like to be able to toggle between these two main selection tools, elliptical and rectangular. Well, to do that, you hold down the shift key and hit the letter M. And every time you hit the letter M while you're holding the shift key down, you're going to toggle between the rectangular and elliptical marquee tools, back and forth. So this is a really useful thing as well. So now that I have the ability to add to subtractions, subtract to subtractions, use circles and squares, I can really start to get pretty sophisticated with the things that I make. I can also move selections around on the canvas, right? So what this looks like is if I were to make some kind of a shape that I wanted to modify, I could do this. I have my rectangular marquee tool selected. And what I can do is make a shape like this, okay? I can deselect and then I can use my elliptical marquee and I can make a big shape like this, take it and drag it over here and hit delete. Now, this is a shape that would be difficult to draw freehand, but because of these selection tools, I can really get precise and make this exactly what I want. All right, now I can again take my rectangular marquee tool and I can add to this right here, option delete, zoom in. And then again, I can go to my elliptical marquee tool, shift M, and I can hold down the option key, make another selection, come over here and hit delete just like that. 
Remember that trick for locking transparency. We'll lock our layer transparency and change our color to black. And now, using that same tool, okay, the elliptical marquee tool, I'm going to make a selection, option delete. This is only going to modify the pixels that are on that layer. And then I can go to Shift M. Now I'm back to my rectangular marquee tool. Option delete. Go back to my elliptical marquee tool. Place that right there. Hit the I key. You remember that's going to temporarily call up my eyedropper so I can tap and select this pink color and hit option delete again. There we go. And now I want to make a circle for this person's eye. Well, I can do a lot of these ovals, but what about a perfect circle? Well, here's another good thing to know right out of the gate. And this is something people don't always learn up front. The shift key, in addition to being used for additive actions in Photoshop, is great for precision. So think about the shift key for precision and addition. Okay, addition and precision. I'm going to hold down the shift key and then start drawing. And look what happens. It's a perfect circle all the way through. You can move that selection right here. Hold down the I key, grab that black, and option delete. And now I've got a little I right there. Okay. Using that same tool, I'm going to make a ellipse like this. And then hold down the option key so I can cut out part of that ellipse. Okay. And look at the shape I made there, a little crescent shape. I can move that into place. Hold down the Option key, grab that black, Option Delete. Now I've got a little mouth. Okay. And finally, using the Elliptical Marquee Tool, okay, I'm going to do this. Just delete that right there. Now we have this funny looking guy, okay? So you can see how you'd be able to do this kind of illustration where you have a shape-based kind of thing. I can move that anywhere I want now. How am I doing that? Well, that'll be the last thing I teach you today and that's the Move tool. Now earlier I said we're gonna skip that tool. And the reason for that is a lot of the times I don't ever need to actually actively select that tool to use it. I prefer to use key commands. I could select it, and once I have it selected, I'm in this mode where I can move all the contents of this layer wherever I like on the canvas. But while I'm using my marquee tool, and I frequently am when I have to move things, making selections and then moving them, if I hold down the command key, you'll notice that my cursor changes to the move tool. And if you're on a PC, the same would be true with a control key. Command, Apple. Control, Windows, okay? So here we go, hold down the Command key and look, I can do the same thing. So this gives me a lot of flexibility using the keyboard. Get yourself a notebook, write these down. We've got the space bar to move things around. Okay, move your canvas around. Zoom in and zoom out using the space bar and the option and the Command keys. Um, Use the, uh, the I key to temporarily call up your eyedropper. So you hold it down, okay? Get a color, let go. And the M key for your marquee tools. Hold down the Shift key to toggle, Shift, and then hit M repeatedly to toggle between your two selection tools. And um, these, are, these are gonna be lifesavers for you. You get really used to using them and they're gonna make everything a lot better for you. All right, so we're gonna continue along this path the next time we meet, and uh, there's a lot more to learn, but just with what we've shown today, creating some layers,
making some selections and filling them with color. Option delete for foreground color, command delete for background color. There is so much you can do already right there. So get used to that, set up a document, play around with those tools. And when I see you next, we're gonna move on down the toolbar to some other useful things and make our way towards brushes where of course a lot of the good stuff happens, all right? Until next time, I wanna thank you for joining me for this. This is gonna be a good class. Um, it's a good refresher for people, but for people who are new, this should get you on your feet, ready to go, making some digital illustrations, okay? Everybody, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Remember to be kind, and I'll say ciao for now.